Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 157 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Today, my guest will be world-renowned actor and BJJ black belt, Sean Patrick Flannery. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But before we do, let's start with our quote. And that is, people think of me as an actor that dabbles in martial arts. But the truth be told, I'm a martial artist that dabbles in acting. And that is from none other than Sean Patrick Flannery, today's guest. I am really excited about having Sean Patrick Flannery on the show today. As I mentioned, he's a world-renowned actor, having appeared in a ton of movies, including Powder, Boondock Saints, The Dead Zone, as well as playing Indiana Jones in The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. He's also appeared on a host of TV shows such as Twilight Zone and Criminal Minds. He has a brand new movie coming out very soon, which looks to be a very interesting, exciting, and thrilling movie called Nefarious. He's also the star of one of, in my opinion, the best jujitsu movies ever made called Born a Champion. In this episode, we do talk about both of those movies, Nefarious and Born a Champion, talk about his acting career and how he's sustained it for so many years and what that's been like for him. We talk about his jiu-jitsu and martial arts journey and how he's built his foundation around self-defense jiu-jitsu. We talk about training kids and what's the most important thing when training kids. We talk about the importance of his faith and family why jiu-jitsu is such an effective self-defense art, as well as his, what he learned from Henry Aikens and training at Hickson's Academy, as well as what his relationship with Master Henzo has meant to him, among other things. So I know you're going to love this interview. I enjoyed doing it. After the interview, make sure you stay tuned for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now, without further ado, let's talk to Sean Patrick. <laughs> All right, I'm speaking with Sean Patrick Flannery, world-renowned actor and fourth-degree BJJ black belt. So welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. I've been a fan of your work for quite some time, and uh, yeah, so it's it's just a thrill for me to be talking to you, and uh, I really do appreciate it, brother. Anytime, man. This is a, you know, it's a passion of mine. To say to say it's a passion is an understatement of the year. So uh, I, I I could I could speak about the martial arts, uh, you know, uh, more readily than anything else. Well, I can certainly uh, appreciate and identify with that as well. So I want to talk to you about uh, a number of things, but especially like you mentioned, martial arts, your martial arts journey, and of course your acting. So we definitely need to start with your upcoming movie soon to be released april 14th movie nefarious so man it looks it looks like a wild one let me just uh read the write-up of of the basic premise of the movie it says on the day of his scheduled execution a convicted serial killer tells a psychiatrist that he's a demon who can possess his body 
As the evaluation ends, he also tells the doctor that he will soon commit, he will soon commit three murders of his own. And like I said, this looks like a wild one. So tell us a little bit about uh, this movie, what it was like doing it, and, and anything you want to, uh, to tell us about it. <clears throat> well, I think the most pertinent information for this podcast should be, it should be known that we shot this in Oklahoma City. And number one, I hope you go see the film. Number two, I think the film is one of the most important films I've ever made. And number three, every single day after rap, because we were filming in Oklahoma City, I went and trained with uh, Lovato Jr. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yes. Yeah. So every single day, uh, he has an academy right there in Oklahoma City, and it was killer. He he was in town, and I got a chance to roll with them almost every day. I, I one of his killer brown belts. Um, it, it, he's got an amazing academy, and every single day, whatever scene that you're watching in that movie, that night, I was on the mat getting the shit kicked out of me by uh, <laughs> one of America's most decorated uh, may, actually maybe the America's most decorated, uh, jujitsu practitioners. Um, wow. and, uh, you know, I've, I, I've known him for a number of years, but I've really never had a chance to get on the mat with him. So it was a great opportunity for me, even while, while we were filming nonstop. It was killer. That is really cool. Very cool. And and when I watch the movie, I'm going to be thinking about that. No doubt. I, I, <laughs> no doubt. I it th- about it during every scene. That's every great. Day. When I would go to makeup, they would have to cover up some Matt Burns, some Gee Burns. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know you're into it when, when that's the case, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you're you're in the middle of this other grand thing, but you're thinking about jiu-jitsu. Man, I, that's I, awesome. I, 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 try, I, don't, I don't leave the house without a belt, a gee, and, some no, and a rash guard and some shorts. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. So this movie, I heard about it. Uh, I have I heard about it on the Glenn Beck show. Um, I tuned in. It was kind of halfway through it. And and he was speaking with either the the director or the producer. I'm not sure. But he couldn't say enough about your performance. I mean, he went on and on about just how blown away and how impressed he was with your acting in this role. I mean, he said it was just amazing and that you should definitely, you know, win some award or something, uh, in his opinion. So. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, <clears throat> every, every time, you know, I hear something like that, it's it's beyond flattering because, uh, you, you know, you know, look, I, I, I've made a career out of doing movies that nobody sees. Um, I've always taken my job incredibly seriously, and I'm I, 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 I've I've never been embarrassed of anything that I've done. You know, I, I've been a blue collar actor my whole life, meaning that. Uh, you know, I, I, I work for a living. I, I've, you know, I've never made the kind of marquee money where, okay, well, I don't have to work ever again. Um, and, and a lot of the things that I'm incredibly proud of have never seen the light of day. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm honored to be employed in this industry. <clears throat> and if anybody even says that, that, that it, it's incredibly flattering. It, it doesn't even have to come to fruition. The fact that somebody even said that and somebody like, right. you know, it, it's, it's beyond flattering. It really is, man. It's uh, but this is a film, you know, th- f- for, this is a film that, uh, this is why you get into the business to get roles like this. And I, I did a movie with, uh, uh, Chuck and Carrie, the writers, directors. Um, I did a movie with them back in 2004 and at the end of us shooting this movie, and again, it's a movie I'm proud of that nobody's ever seen, never really came out, never really. Uh, I mean, discoverability and the marketplace is, is always a, a finicky little item. Um, and so for that reason, the movie was never seen. But I, I, I told them at the time, um, I said, you know, guys, I, I would do a Fruit Loops commercial with you guys. <laughs> and oddly enough, we, you know, we kept in touch throughout the years and you know, a year and a half ago, they called and they said, uh, we, we, we don't have a Fruit Loops commercial, but we have something else I think you might like. And I told them right then on the phone, I said, put me in coach. And they said, well, you know, read it first, read it first. And obviously I read it. And the, these roles, like I said, 
previously or why a young man packs his car up and moves 3,000 miles away across the United States and finds a roommate on Craigslist to pursue an occupation in hopes that one day they'll get a role like this. And oddly enough, you know, I've, I've, I've had, uh, <clears throat> I've had about four of these roles. You know, I, I consider powder to be one of those roles mm -hmm. and th 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 this is no different. Th these are, these are not, uh, it, it, it's just a, a different level of fulfillment for, for, for me as an actor, you know, it really is sustenance for for my creative soul it's and 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 to say that you know it's one of the best scripts i've ever had the honor to to thespian i love that word thespian it it, it, it and, I, and i say it kind of mocking my, my industry but <clears throat> um you know it is and, and and i think the message is incredibly important um i believe every word of it um, and, 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 you know, you know, a lot of times when you say this is an important movie, it means, okay, the movie sucks, but go see it for a message. I think the movie more than stands on its own. I think Chuck and Carrie are amazing writers and almost every film that I do, I adjust, I change the dialogue. Um, when I find things clunky, I didn't change a syllable mm. in the script. Wow. Not a syllable, nor did I in the first time that I worked with them. That's the first script, you know, wow. back in 2004. Um, <clears throat> conversely, I, I, I'm blown away that these guys don't have a closet full of awards because they're, you know, I've been employed in this industry for almost 30, well, actually 32 years, man. God, wow. 32 years. And they are as good as they come. And nobody's ever heard of them. So, uh, but, but, you know, you, 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 if, if, if you really are true to your craft, you know, the, the, the notoriety isn't important. I want to work with people mm. whose material I think is beyond top notch and <laughs> Chuck and Carrie, these two guys are beyond top notch. Well, I really feel like that speaks to your character, you know, as the important thing is to be working and to honing your craft and, and persevering and doing it because you love doing it. Right. Um, a lot of people out there just chasing, you know, the fame of it and maybe they don't get big roles, you know, soon enough and maybe they just abandon it or whatever, but you've done it for, like you said, 32 years. And sometimes with movies that aren't widely distributed or are known about, but that speaks to your character. I said, and what did you, think when you first got, when you read the script, did you have any doubt that you could do this role or did you know, oh man, I can, I can do this one. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think, I think the, the, the truth is, you know, I, I don't want to come off as arrogant in any way, but th th there is a certain element of if you pack your bags up and you drive out to LA which I didn't, by the way, but if you pack your bags up and drive out to L.A. with hopes of being employed as an actor, you are basically saying, I think people will pay $20 to see me for an hour and a half on a screen. That's an arrogant action. It, on the surface, it is. Not to, not to disqualify myself from that, because whenever I was doing theater at university, I thought I was a good actor. I really did. The only reason I didn't move out to L.A. to be an actor was I thought the selection process was rather subjective. You know, you, you, you go, you meet a team of eight producers, and one of them wants to cast his nephew. One of them wants to cast uh, – he, he only likes <clears throat> brunette-haired people. The other one likes skinny fra – you know, it, it, it's all opinion. Yeah. It, I'll give an example. If I was in the Olympics, I'd want to be Usain Bolt and not Greg Louganis. You know, they're both amazing at their craft, but one is judged by a panel of eight. And one, it's it's a meritocracy. There is no debate. If Usain Bolt breaks the tape, he mm -hmm. won. So I, I went out there to be a writer. I wrote a piece of children's theater and I drove out to be a writer. That's not to say that if I thought it was viable, I 100% would have 
gone out to LA to be an actor. I just didn't, I, I didn't think that was a viable option. <clears throat> Little did I know it was. Um, uh, so, so w- w- when I took on this role, I, I, I thought, and look, the jury is still out. Nobody's seen it yet. So people may watch it and think I'm absolutely abysmal, but I knew in my heart that these are the roles that, uh, I salivate over. Mm. These are the roles that every actor wants an opportunity. It's heavy lifting. You know, no, nobody goes in the gym afraid of the heavy weights. That's their goal. If you go into the gym, your goal is to lift more. If you go into a jujitsu mat, your goal is not to tap out white belts. Your goal is to eventually tap out black belts. Your goal is to eventually walk down the street and go, regardless of who I see, I can protect my family. Yes. To the best, better than I could have when I started. That's your goal. So it's the same with acting. I mean, I I, I, I didn't get in, in it to... to to play myself every day on camera. I mean, that's not artistically fulfilling. My goal is to do the most heavy lifting, to jump into things that I'm afraid of. And yes, roles like that scare me. They should scare you. They should scare everybody because they require heavy lifting. And I'm not saying I pulled it off. You know, some people may watch it and go, yeah, well, you tried to lift it, but you fell on your face. <laughs> and that's that's okay. I can take the criticism. But <laughs> right. yes, I... I you know, when they sent me the script, I read it, and then I, I think I, I, I said I sent them an email that just said I'm in. Um, and we got on the phone, and and they asked me, they go, okay, well, we want to ask you, what role do you want to play? And I, at, I, I realized they were serious, and I said, well, I, I want to play Nefarious. They're like, okay, we were hoping you would say that, <laughs> but but you know, I mean, here they are going. It, it is, it's it's a little bit of an intimidating role. You know, um, I mean, the word count, my God, it's, it was like doing a stage play. We basically had two hours of nonstop dialogue and we shot it in less than single digit days. Wow. Um, it, 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 the workload, we shot 17 pages a day of nonstop dialogue. And when I say fast paced, multi-syllabic monologues, I'm not kidding. Um, so just the technical aspect and the memorization but again, you know, I, I, I've been lucky enough to never have, I, I haven't had to get a real job in 32 years and I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. You know, the Lord has provided me with enough and that's all I ask for. I just ask for enough. I don't need, you know, 17 windfalls. I just need enough. And in the process of those 32 years, I haven't had to get what I consider a real job. What I consider a real job is something that you will not do unless people pay you to do. Mm, right. and it's not lost on me that I moved out to L.A. and I was willing to do movies for free, as every actor is. You'll go, they'll go out and they'll do a student film for free, work a month on a movie for free in hopes that they can use that tape to prove their worth to other producers and eventually get paid to do other films. It's not lost on me that I, 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 at one time I would have done this for free. And here's another little glimpse at the wizard behind the curtain. I would have done this for free, 100%. This is why you get into the business. Um, so so I, I, I've had real jobs. You know, when I was eight years old, I had my first paper route. I worked at Church's Fried Chicken. I had moved pianos for Atlas Van Lines. I literally, and I know that's an overused term now, but I was literally a ditch digger. I put culverts under driveways. Um, so it's not lost on me that I get to go and, and fulfill my artistic appetite on movie sets. And it, 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 it truly is not a job. It it's, I, I look back at the last 32 years and I'm grateful. I certainly hope it doesn't end. Because I, I, it, it gives me an opportunity to provide for my kids um, without overly taxing myself physically or mentally. Um, I'm treated incredibly well and well fed. And it allows me all the free time to spend probably 98% of my time on a jujitsu mat doing another thing that I love, arguably, not even arguably, more than I love acting. Yes. And that's the truth. Well, 
a few things stick out about what you just said. First of all, I love your attitude and um, your humbleness and your willingness or, or, you know, you're appreciating the the uh, importance of getting out of your comfort zone to grow and the gratitude you expressed. I mean, you don't take it for granted that you have been afforded the life that you have. So I, I think that's great. And um, before we move more into jujitsu, because I definitely want to talk about that. I, I do want to talk, and this is actually jujitsu related before we leave the acting realm. Uh, Born a Champion, we got to talk about that film because I think it's one of the best jujitsu movies I've ever seen. It was just amazing. So tell us how kind of how that that happened and your thoughts on on being a part of that. Well, first of all, I appreciate it, man. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's not just because I'm talking to you. Uh, I've been a martial arts since I was nine. You know, a lot of people think that I'm an actor who found martial arts and did something you know, in, with this, with this soft occupation to, to fulfill some alpha dream. Um, and I'm certainly not saying I'm some alpha dude, but I've been a martial arts since I was nine. Um, you know, my dad, and my granddaddy got me into, you know, a boxing and martial arts at an early age. And I was completely addicted. Um, when I found jujitsu, um, Right, right when the Pico uh, Hickson's Hickson's Pico Academy closed, <clears throat> you know, I, I've, I've talked about this for a number of people. Um, I've even talked about it with Henry Henry Akins, and it, it it was either like ninety nine, I, I want to say, is when I first started, and it overwhelmed my life. Wow. Um, you know, I, I I was a martial artist that has not stopped studying since he was nine years old, and my first day on the mat, you know, Hickson taught the class. And to be honest, it wasn't much of a class. It was a warm up, and then we sparred. And, uh, <laughs> and I picked uh, a blue belt who was about 135 pounds. I didn't do that to be a, to be a bully because I've been you know right around 165 my whole adult life, 170. Um, and I picked him because I'd heard such mystical stories about this martial art that you know I thought if this first colored belt, this blue belt, can even give me a problem. I, I, I will believe in this. Well, everybody knows how the story ends. Sure. You know, he arm locked me, he shoulder locked me, camored me, wrist locked me, knee barred me, toe hold, uh, choked me, swept me. And there was absolutely nothing that I could do about it. And it was repeatable. Um, I was doing triathlons at the time too. So I was, I was competing at the highest level in everything. I was an athlete and the clouds opened up. And the truth was revealed to me in fighting and martial arts. Uh, that that guy's name is a man now is Matt Akins, Henry Akins' little brother. Oh wow! Um, and I, you know, I signed up for classes that day. I signed up for two times a week. That lasted another two days, and then I changed it to unlimited. And I pretty much never left Hickson's Academy. I was doing the morning class, then the uh, the hour of open mat, then an hour private, and I'd go home. And I'd come back for the evening class and then an, e an hour of open mat after that. And I did that for five years, man. Um, it, it, I was so addicted to it. And because it was such a huge part of my life, you know, and, and I remember when 1993, I want to say it's November 11th, 93, when UFC one came out and, you know, seeing Hoist Gracie do what he did. Mm -hmm. And so I'd always wanted to try this martial art. And so the story of, of, of um, it, it coming to America, um, I wrote this story down in 2007. I wrote it as a short story. And uh, in 2000, maybe 11, uh, I converted it into a script. Um, and this will give you a little window into how difficult it is to get films made. So I wrote the story in 2007, converted it into a script 2011. It wasn't until 2019 that there was a, uh, and the only reason that people read the script or wanted to is because I wrote a book in 2016, it was released and it's called Jane two. And, uh, for whatever reason, I was going to, I was going to sell this book on my blog. It was just a, in case a boulder ever fell on my head, I would have a book with 95% of the things I wanted my kids to know that are in the book. Uh, subsequently, a, a number of people read it and said, wow, you should get this traditionally published. I had no idea how that could possibly happen. Anyway, one thing led to another. Then Hashiat, the biggest publisher on planet Earth, decided to publish my first book. 
Um, people read that. And then the industry came and said, whoa, have you ever written a script? And I said, oddly enough, I have. <laughs> um, and it's about uh, something that I am more passionate about than actually acting. Um, something that has completely overwhelmed my life. And it's a story of a fictitious character named Mickey Kelly. And lo and behold, one read, we set up shop, and we went out and made it. And wow. it is basically my love letter to jiu-jitsu. Um, it is about something that I spend more time with than anything else. It's something – it's it's a huge part of my legacy. It's probably the most important thing that I'll be able to leave behind to my kids. It's something that I'm on the mat with them for today at 5 o'clock. The kids' class starts. So it will be me, my two boys, and the kids' class. Uh, then after that, I will be teaching the adults' class. So you know, there's two classes later today. It, it's something that uh, is, is an integral part of not only my life but my well-being, um, my sense of calm, my sense of confidence, my sense of productivity, my sense of safety, my sense of security. Uh, I, I've never found something – that presents me with a boatload of every form of currency a man can desire. And so I wrote a story about it and, uh, it came out and a handful of people really dug it. And I'm incredibly flattered and appreciative that, uh, you know, the martial arts community is, as, as embraced it like they have, I'm really, really flattered to this day. I still get, you know, Instagram messages with, I, I man, you know, like 500 words, just long things talking about, you know, they saw Born a Champion and it, and it, and it spoke to them in a certain way. And, you know, those messages are, are, they are, they are food for the human condition, man. I mean, I, I, I'm not kidding. I screenshot some of those and I go back and I reread them, you know, in the times of doubt you go, okay, well you, you meant something to this person, right? right. you know, it's, uh, those are, I got to tell you, some of those Instagram messages where they pour out their heart and tell me what something meant to them, it, it's more important than the paycheck, man. I mean, it's not going to keep the lights on, but it's going to keep my internal flame glowing hot as uh, piping hot. I can appreciate that because a paycheck's great, but this speaks to the impact you're making in people's lives. And, uh, man, that's worth so much, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 I, I can't speak highly enough about when people – you know, convey their feelings. And, and, and I'm grateful for social media in that regard, because, you know, previously when you do a film, there, there's nobody on the set that's paying attention to what you're doing. You know, the sound guy, the sound guy's making sure a jet's not flying over the camera operators, making sure that the camera frame is, you know, that the, 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 the boom operator is not in camera. Um, the only way you get feedback is from meeting people in person. But now with social media, people can reach right out to me and say, Hey, you suck in this or holy cow, this really affected me. Yeah. And it really is. It, it's, it's a brand new bank account that you get. That's awesome. <clears throat> That's very, very awesome. And you know, one thing I really appreciate about the movie is, you know, people that are obsessed with martial arts, will will go to a martial arts movie, you know, for the martial arts. But uh, a lot of times they're lacking in just real depth of a story, right? Uh, more times than not, some of them are pretty good, but th this one, man, it, it was such a great story, even beyond the, the martial arts element, the, the characters, you know, the character development, the story, the love story, the friendship. Um, and then of course the, the martial arts and the fighting, the fighting, but then the homage to the old school type BJJ, the self-defense. I love it, man. I mean, uh, I can't say enough about all aspects of this that spoke to me for sure. Well, I appreciate it. You know, I mean, ultimately what I wrote the, the film about, <clears throat> and you're right, the martial art could have could have been about golf. It, it's a story about family, faith and fatherhood. That's what it's about. Yes. And, you know, if, if I would sell it on that regards, the industry would have never made a film about faith. You know, uh, certainly right. that, you know, they, they wouldn't they wouldn't have made a film about family. Um, and I, and I can tell you some inside stories about they wanted to remove the God aspect. Um, one of the reasons that this character fell in love with his wife is she was asking him what he does. And on the airplane, as you remember, yes. he asks her, what about you? Um, what do you want to do? 
and she says, I want to be a mom. And, uh, she says, I want to be a stay at home mom. That's what she says. Wow. Um, and they campaigned hard to get that line removed. Really? And I was pretty rooted and grounded that the line had to stay. Uh, good for um, you. It's, 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 it was one of the most impactful lines that my wife ever said to me. Mm. And I knew in that moment, this girl is cut from a different cloth. Right. We are meant to be together. You know, it takes a, a certain type of person that says, no, I want to find a man and I want to operate with teamwork and I want to raise a family with teamwork. Um, and I want somebody, at least one of us at all times to be hand on, hands on and raising our child. And so, yeah, the film is about family, faith and fatherhood. That, but that, <clears throat> if, if, I, if I can wrap it under the guise of an action martial arts film, then that's OK. But I have yeah. to tell stories that are true to myself. That's why it's so good, man. And, and uh, it gave me chills when you were just talking about, you know, the uh, what she said on the plane and uh, and also related it to your wife. Yeah, it's 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 not common anymore for someone to be cut from that cloth and want to, you know, instead of chasing your career, not that there's anything wrong with that. But when it comes to starting a family and saying, I'm going to stay home and and one of us are going to be there at all times to really be that foundation and set the foundation for those kids, I, it's the most important thing in the world. And you just don't hear about it near as much as you used to. So I'd really, uh, I do admire that. No, you, you know, you're right. There, there's another line when they're on the balcony and, you know, money is tight. And she says, well, maybe I can go back to work. And he says, and what? Then spend that money to hire somebody else to exactly. raise Exactly. And exactly. they wanted to remove that. But I, I, I'll tell you, if there is one moment that made me commit my life to my wife, it was that line. It was that line saying, I want to meet a man and be a stay at home mom and raise a traditional family. Wow. And I thought, oh, my God, yeah. this climate in Los Angeles for somebody to say that is is and that was everything that I wanted. And, wow. uh, it, you know, th 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 they, they didn't want that line in there either because it sounded disparaging. Look, I'm a firm believer that you can't champion one thing without stigmatizing the other. But everybody's entitled to their opinion. Yeah. For me, raising a kid actually involves the first word, raising, not mm -hmm. outsourcing. Yes. For some reason today, we've donated the nature, but we outsource the nurture. There's two parts, parts of being a parent. And it's not just the science. It's not just the DNA. Um, and to find somebody, I wanted to put that in a story. I wanted them to be their life to be old school. And I wanted the martial art to be old school. My heart is in old school martial arts. Well, jujitsu. And when I say that, you know, it, you, you go on the Internet and people are like, well, what is old school jujitsu? Well, old school jujitsu satisfies three questions. Does it work with street clothes on? Does it work without street clothes on? And does it work when punches are involved? Yeah. If the answer to any of those are no, it is not old school fighting jujitsu. You know, okay. I, I have all of my students write a mission statement whenever they come into the academy because I want to make sure everybody's pursuing the same goal. You know, and if, if, you, if you come into my academy and you want to win the Gi Pan Ams, I, it's probably not the best academy for you. If you're worried about blunt force trauma, then you are assigning one of your most valuable appendages into protecting, say, your face or your, your torso when really punches aren't allowed. So you could be applying that appendage to a sweep. There are higher leverage sweeps out there when you don't have to concern yourself with blunt force trauma. Mm -hmm. But then again, it, it, it's a very different result in the Chevron parking lot. So it's what is your mission statement? What are you trying to achieve? And the roots of, of my martial arts journey was always confidence and self-defense and protecting myself when there are no rules. I want to be able to use street clothes. I want to be able to escape from the bottom with all the friction of clothing. I also want to be able to submit a sweaty, slippery arm without clothing. And I also want to be able to do it all when somebody is swinging violently for my vital organs. Those are the three conditions, just like my mindset on family, old school values. I not only want to donate the nature, but I want to be there for the nurture. Yeah. And to me, 
the martial art and the lifestyle of Mickey Kelly par parallel one another. It's where my heart is in family and where my heart is in the martial art of jujitsu. Well, I love the, the way the two are intertwined because uh, you have to be able to model, right, what you want to teach your, uh, your offspring. And if you're not there, you can't be modeling it, you know. You could say stuff uh, or, like you said, you've outsourced it. And what are they modeling? And hopefully they would be modeling your values too, but it's still not the same. So really admire that. And then with the jiu-jitsu, uh, I think it's a shame when, when one camp, if you will, of jiu-jitsu trashes on the other. You know, if, you, if you're mainly competition, good. Enjoy that. It's beautiful. It's awesome. I'd love to watch it. But don't trash on self-defense oriented and vice versa. Um, my My biggest thing is like you is, is can you protect yourself? Are you confident? Do you have those skills when it, when it counts? So I'm drawn a lot more to that practice that, but see the beauty in all aspects. I do think when it comes to self-defense, and I've said this before, I, I would like to see academies pull in a little more realistic things. Like, like you said, um, in the parking lot and you don't have to be on the pavement, but wear street clothes, go on a, a hill that's that's not level, you know, different things like that. Um, do it under lower lighting. Invoke some kind of stress, like someone getting in your face and yelling a little bit just so you, yeah, you'll you be used to feeling that adrenaline dump. Things like that that do, uh, of course, not when someone just walks in any of this stuff, but if you're on you know, your journey a while, um, maybe more advanced class or whatever, really start bringing some of these elements in to make it a little more realistic. What do you think of that? Look, you know, just like you said, everybody is entitled to learn whatever they want to learn and pursue pursue their own goals. But we all have to be painfully honest about what our preparation entitles us for. You know, if, if I wanted to teach somebody to win the IBJJF PANS, there, there's a large percentage of my curriculum that I would never bother teaching them. Right. I would never bother teaching them. Case of Gatami headlock escapes. Because jujitsu guys don't grab the head. They don't. Right. Because they know that you got a good possibility of having your back taken. Yeah. Well, realistically, you're not going to get your back taken because most of the guys don't drill headlock escapes. Exactly. For example, it, you know, so it, it, I'm a, I, I can readily admit that my system is not the best for an IBJJF gi tournament. It's not the best. And conversely, then you have the sport guys saying, well, you know, ours is good for sport, but it's also, we, we can also fight. You. Well, yes, you can. I, I agree. Any, any Pan Am competitor is going to be fine on the Chevron parking lot. Having said that, um, if it's a lot, like, like, you know, the Valente brothers are pretty much just the self-defense school to, 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 to my knowledge. Um, if, if a Valente Brothers guy got in a scuffle at the Chevron parking lot and, say, uh, a strictly sport Gracie Baja practitioner, I would say the Valente Brothers practitioner probably will not be lumped up as much as the, the sport player for whatever academy, if, if it's strictly sport. Um, it, it, there are academies, as you know, that, that don't bother teaching takedowns because in a tournament scenario – you can pull guard. You can butt scoot. Why would you waste time teaching someone how to close the distance to clinch when you can just get the party started on your butt and teach them to sweep and play play guard? Right. And they're not wrong in that. That's that that is not a wrong recipe if your objective is to win an IBJJF tournament. Um, and 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 I have nothing against people that want to pursue that. That's killer. I'm envious of some of those games where they take a lapel out and they twist it around and go in between the legs and double wrap it. And I'm like, oh, my God, who even thought where, – where, where did your brain go to even think up of this? Right. Um, but having said that, any kindergartner can go, oh, OK, well, couldn't the guy stomp on his face? Well, yes, but in tournaments that's not allowed. So let's take advantage of that rule and let's get a very, very high leverage sweep in here. I, I, I'm, I'm not – against sport jujitsu at all I, I love that and i play with some of the lapel things but at, at at the end of the day i do believe that one is a better better recipe for fighting and one is a better recipe for sport and they both have things that i would champion and things that i would stigmatize my, my, my own academy 
my own academy is not the best if you want to go win the IBJJF Worlds. It's not. Right. Period. Right. I can admit that. Well, like you said, there, there's some of the foundational elements, and one being um, someone trying to take your head off or you know trying to punch. So if you are saying that you're self defense oriented or that's your goal, uh, but you're not training with someone throwing punches, it, it's really you're at a loss because no matter what grappling someone has under their belt, they're going to be better than the average person at, at you know any kind of encounter. However. You manage the distance differently when someone's trying to punch you. And if you're not versed in that, you get one, one, you know, crack to the skull and that's going to change everything. So, well, it it really has become, you know, I I did Taekwondo as a kid and I I was there through the de-evolution of Taekwondo Um, from the original Korean violent Taekwondo that mm-hmm. looked more like Muay Thai. Then today, the Taekwondo Academy next to the Piggly Wiggly that's being led by some obese gentleman that couldn't lift <laughs> his leg above his knee. My God. Right. I mean, yes. that transformation is – even look at the Taekwondo stance where they're leaning back, their hands are at their hips. Uh-huh. It, it resembles nothing in a realistic fight. Right. And I, I say that with all the love in the world. But – tournament sport jiu-jitsu is doing that any kindergartner could look at a mm-hmm. ibjjf match where somebody drops their butt and scoots forward and they both pull out their lapels and and you know it's, i always make a joke back in the 90s if you went to a tournament and brought your girlfriend she was like oh my god you are violent <laughs> you know in, in 2023 your girlfriend's like oh my god that's so cute my nephew <laughs> does that he's four he's a black belt too you know it's uh, right they, they, they visually the, the 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 silhouette signature could not be more different than a, a, a 1998 tournament right. and a 2023. And there's nothing wrong with that. They, they have really evolved in pursuit of their unique goal. But in doing that, if, if your mission statement was, you know, self-defense and whatnot, and like you said, jujitsu is so profoundly powerful that even a butt scooter would wreck anybody in the Kroger parking lot. I mean, you and I both know that. It's like, I mean, outside of any accident, right. but at the same time, if you, if look, man, if there's a, a D1 strong safety that is angry and intent on opening up your face and you uh-huh. don't know, you know, distance dictates damage. If you yes. don't know how to di- dis- dictate the distance, oh man. You're going to take some serious damage. <laughs> you're going to take some serious damage. Right. And that's just the truth of it. You know, we don't we, we we don't know because, you know, it, it's all theory now. You know, some of these sport players going, well, it would work just the same. Look, nine times out of 10, you're probably going to be right. But, man, if you're not preparing for full force blows coming at your face and I mean prepare by by doing it, then you're, you're, you're in for a very rude awakening on what works and what does not work. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. <clears throat> just like going back to those early UFCs. And I, and I kind of miss those early ones because it was just so raw, right? I mean, it's evolved into a, a great sport, you know, but those fights, which is what they were, you know, each person thought they were going to do great with their style. But when that style doesn't work for whatever reason, you're taken out of your element, maybe the stand-up guy got taken down or fell or whatever, uh, it's a whole different world. And if you're not ready for that and where it could go, And you're just, you're at a loss. You're in for a bad day. Yeah, that that was my favorite era by a mile as well. And for that very reason, because at our core, we want to know, you know, if two men enter a dark alley, which one's going to come out? And that satisfied, that answered the question. Um, It answered the question, independent styles, there is one not only that wins, but stands head and shoulders above all else. And that is jujitsu. Even... Chel Sonnen said, you know, wrestling is the best. The only thing it beats it is jujitsu. And and it's true. You you don't see anybody from any sport come into the UFC and go, man, you know what? I got to get on my Kempo because I never studied Kempo but before my first fight. I got to get in Kempo. That never happens. Nobody comes in and says, you know, all I am is a D1 wrestler with some Muay Thai, I, but I don't have any Taekwondo. I really got to brush <laughs> up. That never happens. There's, you know, you use wrestling to get to a clinch and get it to the ground. 
and then where 90% of it is, is going to, or you use wrestling to make sure right. it does not go to the ground. And then you better damn well yep. be a good striker. Or you use wrestling to get it to the ground, and then you better damn well be a good jujitsu practitioner. Exactly right. So it, it, it's the, the, the proof is already out there, and there's empirical evidence. You know, you, you have to know how to bring somebody to the ground, and you have to know how to submit them and stay safe. It, it's or, or, or if if they want to take you to the ground, if if your if your goal is to knock them out with blunt force trauma standing on your feet, you better be good enough on your feet to prevent a takedown and hope that an accident never happens and you fall over. Because if you do and they know ground and you do not, you do not have a shot. You do not have a shot. Conversely, on the feet, again, if you take a D1 strong safety from some college football team, you got a possibility of getting KO'd mm -hmm. on the feet. Yeah. You have a possibility. If you take that same guy with a black belt on the ground, you don't have a possibility of getting triangled. He's not going to accidentally fall into an omoplata. It, 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 it's a very, very much more lopsided skill set. Yes. Indeed. Indeed. So you mentioned family and uh, your kids, and they train. What do you, what do you think is the most important thing to make sure kids know or learn uh, in jiu-jitsu training? If you want to know specific techniques or theories, specific techniques, headlock mm -hmm. escapes, period. Positional dominance and headlock escapes. It's the one thing that is going to happen. I mean, if you YouTube fights, schoolroom fights, yes. a headlock is there. And if you don't know, I don't mean one lesson, but I mean if you don't put those into violent reps almost every single day, both standing headlocks and ground headlocks, both front headlocks, a.k.a. guillotines, and know how to get out, it, it, it's it's everything. And after that, it would be all the other escapes, escapes from side control. Really, in, in self-defense and street fights, any explosive bridge works on an untrained person if they're mounted on you. Um, you, you really need to focus on mount escapes once you go against other ground guys. But if you're preparing for the street, first and foremost, your escapes. The first goal, the first milestone is to be mm -hmm. able to survive. The second milestone, what I tell all my kids, first thing you want to do is you want to pick somebody that started maybe six months before you. Your first goal is to roll with them for five minutes and five minutes and stay alive. Once you do that with practiced regularity, your second goal is now I roll with them five, mon five minutes. And not only do I not get submitted, but on occasion, I escape bad positions. So now are you not only finding comfort and safety from the bottom for five minutes, now, with practiced regularity, you're escaping the bad positions. Then the third stage, you want to roll with them for five minutes, find comfort when you're on the bottom, ultimately escape. The third step is now you can positionally dominate them. After you've found safety and escaped a bad position, you positionally dominate. The fourth and the final, which is where all the glory is, but it really needs to be put in fourth position, yep. is the submission. Now you can stay alive, find comfort in horrible positions, ultimately escape, ultimately positionally dominate, and finally submit them. Yes. In that order. Specifically technique, headlock escapes. But as a general, all of your escapes and your safety, your distance management, your protection when you're on the bottom, all of those are, are crucial for kids because that's what your that's what your son or your daughter is going to find on a playground. Yep, absolutely. You know, I, I don't need to teach them how to defend a bear and bolo. Come on, man. The dude in third grade, Tommy, who's snot out of his mouth, <laughs> he's not going to drop to his butt and bear and bolo. I mean, you know, yeah. You you you, you, you want to learn to defeat the things that you're going to see ninety nine percent of the time. Absolutely. Headlocks are it. Headlocks and just. Um tackles you know unskilled tackles and things like that but you, you know you you framed it we framed it as far as kids but that that same hierarchy is totally what adults need you know to be able to defend first and then escape and then positionally control and then maybe submission so uh, that's across the board right yeah I, I mean i mean the terminology is is different in the kids class a little bit you frame it so that they can understand the words better mm -hmm. uh the adult class is far more descriptive and we talk about much, much more fine-tuned nuances, but the curriculum is exactly the same. A fight is a fight. Right. And, and the same things happen in youth that happen with adults. 
You know, that's why that same hierarchy of priority exists with kids and adults. It's no different. Agree. Great. So why is jujitsu so effective as a self-defense art? <clears throat> because it's counterintuitive. You come out of the womb and you know, as a child, you'll see kids at one years old, one year old, they'll ball up their fist and they'll swing it at something. Every kid knows what throwing a punch does. Even a kid that's never trained anything before, they get mad and they throw a punch at maybe the tabletop or their breakfast or at another child. All, kids also know that whenever that punch comes, their hands come up. They just got to put something in front of them. And, and now technically, a one-year-old doesn't know how to sit down on a punch. They don't know technically how, but they know that ball up the hand and swing it. All the instincts with striking are 100% correct. All the instincts with grappling are incorrect. If somebody straddles you, that you turn over. You have to relearn that instinct. Also, when you're mounted, if somebody's swinging at your face, your hands go up to your face. It takes a relearn to put wedges in between his thighs and your rib cage and use your hips to unbalance him and defend the strikes. That's why if you know it and somebody else doesn't, they have hardly a chance in hell of besting you. But conversely, with striking, any strong, explosive, fast twitch athletic guy can KO somebody. It's very true. Just, just from being an athlete. That's what makes it so powerful is, is the skill set has to, you know, that's why you can teach people if you're three belts ahead of them, they're not going to catch up overnight. It's not something. You can, they can be privy to the information, but to develop a level of mastery that will allow them to catch up to you will take years. And it's provable. You go into any academy and there's a 65-year-old fifth-degree black belt and you're a 22-year-old athlete and you get wrecked. That would not happen in boxing. Right. A 22-year-old explosive young dude – just on the speed and athleticism alone, even if he's doing Harrison Ford haymakers, man, one can come into contact. But conversely, <laughs> Harrison on Ford haymakers. Mat, <laughs> I, love, but, I like that. But conversely, on a jujitsu mat, it's not going to happen. It's just a slow, methodical drowning. Right. And it's not just me talking. It happens every single day. Yeah, every single day. It's true. And that's why I love the scene in – a champion when you when you turn and lock the door and you come over and you give them a preview of what's going to happen it's just that happens so often just that scripted you know just just like that so that's that's amazing yeah that, that's why i wrote it because i believe in it you know yeah. to an untrained person it is this is what's going to happen i'm going to do this i'm going to do it in that order and there's not a damn thing you can <laughs> exactly. do about it. and to prove to prove that it's not a fluke we'll stand up and we'll do it all over <laughs> right love it love it so you mentioned Hickson, and you also um, spent a good amount of time with Henzo, if I'm not mistaken. Can you speak a little bit to the the time with uh, either or both of those guys and just what you took away from, from those times? You know, I got to say, you know, my heart is old school fighting jujitsu. And Hickson's Academy was one of the roughest places I've ever been in. And I say this with all the humility in the world and almost embarrassment there are days that I left there almost in tears um, the guys there would mount you and I'm a white belt and they would not let you out um, Henry Akins would mount me and he'd be smacking me in the face and I'd tap out just for the oh, the pressure and you know literally they'd say man you ain't tapping to that and they just stay mounted oh, and I came to panicking um, and, and abject fear now, here's the deal. I could not be more grateful for having been forced to go through that. Having said that, I would never want to do it again <laughs> with, with, without the skill set. But, but one, one of the benefits is now you're not going to break me right, from being right. on top. You know, you, 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 there's no claustrophobia now. There is no – I will find that angle and let my lungs expand to get an airflow. Uh, it, 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 and what we were talking about with self-defense, that is par of paramount importance. But if you're never put in that situation, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. 
when 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 you have to to survive you will find those angles of comfort you will find you will start to define wedges and frames on your own because you have to and i am so grateful i went through it um having said that i cannot believe that that academy survived multiple lawsuits yeah. <laughs> i mean it's uh, you know it was a very different time when you know people were coming over from brazil they had no idea of the litigious nature of los angeles and you know, it, it, it was it was crazy. I, I am incredibly grateful. I mean, that is the curriculum that I adhere to. Um, I think Henry Akins is one of the most nuanced instructors with the lost mm-hmm. details of jujitsu on the planet Earth. Um, and I'm I'm grateful to have have had to have been by his side when he was watching Hickson do things and trying to figure out what was verbally left off the table. You know, a lot of times Hickson would show a position and he would say, okay, man, you push it and make for escapey. And, you know, there was 12 exactly. details that he was doing, but the words were coming out, push here and make for escapey. And it, it's because of that lack of English that it forced us to look and go, there's more here. What is he doing that he's not saying? And it's not because he's holding back. He just didn't have a great command of the English language. It was it was a wonderful time to be at that academy. As far as Henzo, Henzo is probably the greatest human in in jujitsu. The the best personality, the most giving, the most loving. Um, obviously, his jujitsu is beyond reproach. But my formative years were all at Hickson's. Um, I went brown and black under Henzo. So I kind of almost had a signature under my belt. Um, I would have loved equally if I started at Henzo's, but as far as a person, I've never met somebody that is that open armed and loving and giving his mind is in the right place, his values, his ethics. He is a stand up man, a family man. He's, he is a man of God. He is a father. He is all of those things that I, if, 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 if they're not looking up to me, I'd like my kids to look wow. up to. I'll tell you, when I wrote the script, um, and Hinzo, Hinzo can tell you the same thing. I sent uh, two emails out. I sent an email to Hickson, and I, I sent an email to Hinzo. And I say this with all the love in my heart. Henzo responded within hours and said, where do I need to go? When do you need me there? I never heard back from Hickson. Um, and converse, and subsequently, Henzo was in the movie, and I could not be more grateful. He came, we spent time on the set, and I simply reached out oh, with wow. an email. And, and to be honest, I didn't think either one would respond. It was a shot in the dark. Like, what, what are the odds that Hickson or Henzo would come and be in my movie? And it brought me to tears, That's man. Awesome. In front of my phone, reading the email, wh- where do I need to go? When do you need me? I was like, I, 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 I mean, my voice started shaking. I got a lot, even recollecting it now. I'm glad the camera's not on because, man, I'll tell you, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen, man. Yeah. And he jumped on a plane and he came out. And he was in my film, and I, I it, it it truly is one of the highlights of my life, and, and and not just him being in the film. That email, that immediate response was it really shook me to my core, yeah. and I I I could not be more grateful, man. I really I really could not be more grateful. That's amazing. Henzo is is to me, he is he is the gold standard in in our martial art. Across the board, not just not just his teaching, not just technically, but as a man, as somebody that we want to endeavor to persevere, to be like on all regards. I think the I think that is a he's one, one, one of the best humans out there. Wow. I really do. Wow. Well, what a great tribute uh, to him. And uh, he's obviously had a major impact uh, on you in your life. And it's meant a lot. So that's that's really great. So glad that 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 you're able to to have him do that and that he was the kind of person like you said that 
didn't even think about it. Just got back with you and hey, I'm in. Just like you, I'm in. So that's amazing. A couple of other small things before we uh, close. I want to respect your time, brother. Um, you mentioned faith. Do you want to speak a little bit to uh, to your faith and what it means to you? Um, you know, I think everybody's relationship with, you know, their existence is a personal thing. And I think there, there are, you know, a lot of structured formulas, meaning, you, you know, structured religions that people think I either have to wholeheartedly go into this or not at all. And, you know, I, 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 I was born in Louisiana, raised in Texas. We said grace at every supper. We said our prayers at bedtime. I've always had a relationship with God. I've always believed that there is that I am in service of something greater than myself. Always. My kids believe the same thing. And it's not just some blind faith. My logical mind can't imagine a self-moisturizing autofocus eye coming into existence by two rocks colliding. I, my, my brain can't right. go there. Unless there is a supreme being and a divine creation with a purpose, I can't imagine that any of this is random chance. I, any, any more so than a tornado whirling through a junkyard and creating a Boeing 747. I, I can't imagine it. So to me, faith is very logical. Um, but I'm... I'm grateful for all of the things that I have in my life. And I think everybody has moments in their life where they think the odds were against this happening. And I have a number of those moments in my life where I can't explain things that happened, things that happened that shouldn't have happened. I don't have a way to explain it outside of something, someone, somewhere watching out for me and pushing me in a little bit of a different direction. Um, so my relationship with God is one of servitude and one of gratitude. And I'm not ashamed of it. You know, people can talk about, you know, the flying spaghetti monster in the sky all they want. Um, but my life has blessed me. Um, he brought me my wife that could not be more perfectly tailored for myself. The greatest gift I've ever been given was, I believe, from God, and it was presenting my wife in front of me. And I, I could not imagine a woman more down to the DNA, detailed to complement my lifestyle, my parenting style, my loving style, etc. And things like that don't happen. They just don't happen by random chance. And I'm grateful, and I want to show gratitude every single day for my God above. Man, respect. I love it, man. Thank you for sharing. That's uh, it's very inspiring for sure. One last thing. You had a quote I read that says, do something today that your future will thank you for. So can you just expand a little on that notion? Yeah. You know, I'm a firm believer that, uh, you know, if you're presented with 15 options and you don't have any criteria for weighing them, if you select the uncomfortable one, 99% of the time you will mm. be correct. Um, everything good in my la life came after adversity, every single thing. And I'm a firm believer in delayed gratification. There are certain rules that I abide by every single day and I hold myself accountable I believe the snooze button is the first lie you will tell yourself of the day. And if you can't keep a promise to yourself, don't expect anybody else to. So what does that mean? That means do something today that may be incredibly uncomfortable, but tomorrow you will value. <clears throat> and it requires you to understand the difference between fun and happiness. Yes. Fun is what you experience during an activity. Happiness is what you experience after an activity. For example, if you, if you stay home and you play 10 hours of video games, that's fun. But I promise you, after that 10 hours, you're not happy with yourself. If you work out, if you wake up, you don't hit the snooze button, and you immediately do your 100 squats of the day, 
it's painful. It's uncomfortable. But middle of the day, you feel good about right. yourself. You are thankful that you did that. And that really, you know, one of the biggest blessings you can give yourself is that Sorry. of enduring discomfort for the promise of, no look, you, 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 you mortgage, you, 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 you amortize your life by front loading discomfort. If you front load yes. discomfort, you will minimize it in the future. And it's compounded interest. If I do, say, 10 points of pain in my earlier life, it will prevent 100 in my later life. That's the way, that's the way life goes, and people don't understand it. it it's, it's, you know, do, doing a physical activity. You know, on my Jiu-Jitsu Academy, we have our, our, our thank you letter. And our thank you letter is whoever you think stuck you here, whether you think it was two rocks colliding or a supreme being. Your thank you letter is only ever going to be – your thank you letter is saying thank you for the gift you've been given, and that gift is your body and your life. Your thank you letter is ever going to be anything more than what you do with that gift. So we do four things every single day, my kids' class and my adults alone. We do four things, and that's our thank you letter to whoever you think gave you this. We eat good. We sleep good. We train our body and we train our mind. If you can limit your life down to simply adhering to those four things, you'll get anything you want in your life. And what I mean, eat good, I don't mean like, oh, okay, I only had half a Twinkie. I mean eat good. Educate yourself and use food as medicine so you don't have to, in the future, take medicine to counteract all the garbage food that you ate. If you eat good and you sleep good and you actively make progress mentally and physically, nothing will stand in your way. But that requires front-loaded discomfort, and a lot of people aren't willing to do it. And today, I, I got to you know tell you, one, one, I, I mean, childhood obesity has gone through the roof. And 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 look again, you can't champion one thing without stigmatizing another. Part of being a good parent is raising a physically able child. Yeah, I would be sure. remiss if I told you I thought anything other than bad parenting when I see a fat child that's going to get heart disease when they're 40. You're, you're, you're mm -hmm. doing your child an incredible disservice. Kids have to be trained not only to be smart. Look, somewhere along the line, we thought, OK, yeah, it's important. you got to send your kids to school. But no, yeah. they, don't, they don't have to do it in physical activity. No. You know, kids go to school until 4 o'clock. Then they come home for 4, and some kids do their homework until 10. It's equally as important for longevity and for you to, to enhance your mental yeah. capacity and the way your brain works to physically train your body. It's the four things. Eat good, sleep good, train your body, train your mind. And we do those four every day. But again, they require front-loaded discomfort. And uncomfortable yes. is something that people don't want to reach out and hug. I promise oh, you, man, one, one gram of discomfort today print prevents 10 tomorrow. Well, I'm a firm believer in, in, in intentional discomfort, like ice baths and various things to, to make yourself because we're so, we've gotten so soft in the, in the, in our society that we're always climate controlled, right? We're always comfortable and we're afraid to get out of that. And, but I like your notion of front loaded discomfort because it's, it's doing stuff now. It's putting in the work, it's investing. So you'll reap the benefits later. And that goes back to your foundation of, of old school, right? Because Nowadays, it's uh, the opposite. It's entitlement. But when you have a firm foundation of of those principles guiding you, uh, it's it makes a lot of sense. It's something I greatly admire. Well, that, that's another thing that I wrote into uh, Born a Champion is I, you know, they wanted to remove the meritocracy speech. Um, but I think we can all agree there definitely is a war on meritocracy going going at least in the United States right now. But that's one of the yeah. things that I absolutely adore about martial arts. Is there is no bell curve, <laughs> which you know a, a belt is generally speaking. I mean, there's some fake belts out there, but they're few and far between. If you go into a jujitsu mat and somebody has a higher belt than you, more than likely they're going to be better than you. And and if not, the truth is going to come out shortly after you clap hands. It is it is a strict and stringent meritocracy. You do not get something you do not work for and you do not earn. Your level of confidence is directly proportional to the work that you have left on the mat. And I, I, 
I, I believe in that. The meritocratic aspect of martial arts and sports in general is something that is just painfully missing from society. And kids don't understand that the, the, the necessity of front-loading discomfort to reap the benefits of getting their hand raised. And I mean figuratively and metaphorically and literally. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, that's a, a huge aspect of life is getting your hand raised and pursuing those moments, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in fatherhood, whether it's on a wrestling mat, a jujitsu mat, whether it's in the business world. Nobody's going to give it to you. No one. Despite what the government will try to reach out and hand you and make you feel good with, it's not the same thing, man. Right. It is not the same thing. Totally. Totally not the same thing. You haven't earned it. So where is your academy? How can people find your academy, but also you on social media? Any uh, Anything you want to put out there or to have people to be able to uh, touch base with you? Uh. My Facebook is my name, you know, Sean Patrick Flannery. Um, my Instagram is SP Flannery. That's Flannery with one N. Uh, so I have two locations here in Houston of Houston Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And actually, it's outside of Houston. Um, I'm outside of the city limits. One is on my property. And if you look at like the Instagram account, it says a secret, you know, location. Now, that's because it's on my property. That's why I don't list the address. So the people that train at my my, on my property, you know, they're heavily vetted. Um, um, and, and we've got a great group. We got a great kids group. We got a great adults group. Then I have another location in spring, Texas, uh, where obviously that's a commercial. So we accept all students. Um, but you know, jujitsu is a huge part of my life. Teaching and leaving something behind the aspect of legacy is a huge part of my life. So it is of paramount importance. Well, you were certainly Leave, building and leaving a great legacy, my friend, and certainly have had impact on so many people around the world with your jujitsu as well as with your acting. So hats off to you, man. Great respect. I appreciate you spending time and letting us learn more about you as a person and, uh, and your knowledge and insights. Want to make sure we remind everybody to go see your latest movie, nefarious uh, it's going to be amazing can't wait to see it so thank you again for taking time and, and uh letting us know more about you brother no i really appreciate it thanks for the time god bless and godspeed brother awesome take care brother all right really enjoyed that conversation with sean patrick flannery what an interesting guy he is man what a what an interesting life he's had and what what a passion for jujitsu so Really grateful for that opportunity. All right, this episode is brought to you by Breathing for BJJ. And Breathing for BJJ is a 31-day online video program that I spent two years in developing, and it's designed to transform your jiu-jitsu experience. You know, there's nothing more important than your breathing. It makes a profound difference in your jiu-jitsu experience. Optimizing your breathing takes your jiu-jitsu experience to a whole new level and has a huge impact on your performance. Learning to regulate your breathing can completely transform your jiu-jitsu experience. Being able to slow your breathing down when you need to, create energy when needed, breathe when in uncomfortable positions and situations, and to find the calm within the chaos are skills you need to master to create and achieve the optimal jiu-jitsu experience. This program uses a biomechanical approach to actually target and strengthen your specific breathing muscles, creating efficiency and effectiveness in your functional capacity to breathe. It's time to make breathing the foundation of your BJJ. And you can find out more at www.breathingforbjj.com. All right, up next is the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. There are a few things you just can't learn from a textbook that you have to live through, to see, to be fully entrenched in, because here is a simple truth. 
This world is a tough place. Getting what you want, making the most of the time you have requires that you put yourself in the position to succeed. It means you see a finish line before one exists. Look, no one's ever gonna call you and tell you how incredible your idea is. You can't build a business on potential or win a championship on promise. Results are binary. You either accomplished something or you simply did not, right? That's it. That's what people see, the result. So that means every second, every step of the way from where you are right now until you cross the finish line depends on you and your thoughts. How you internalize failure, how you look at setbacks, when no one is around to pat you on the back or tell you how great you are, will you have enough self-belief to move forward? Because my friends, that's the hardest part. That's what no one talks about. Having the courage to wake up every single day of your life and know that you are building towards something incredible. You are creating a masterpiece from the ground up. And that means that when you're looking in the mirror, you believe in what's staring back at you. You see the unseen and you are willing to bring it to life. That is the foundation that you build greatness on. And it's a daily pursuit, creating milestones, designing the small wins that keep you going, that keep you moving, that get you past all those times you so desperately want to turn around, but know that for you, it simply isn't an option. That is not your reality. You have more waiting for you. And so you press on, cloaked in confidence, you move into the unknown, seeking the day the rest of the world looks up and calls you lucky. They'll look at what you built and say how fortunate you are, but they won't comprehend the 20 hour days, the focus, the ridicule for being different or obsessive or non-conformist. They won't know that self-belief trumped all of that that it was everything. The word great is separate for a reason. It implies a specific set of beliefs and values. It means you saw light when most people saw darkness. It means you said yes when most people said no. You move forward when the rest of the world turned around. Believe in your greatness. See it, live it. It is there and you need to know that it's there because it will make all the difference. Your self-belief will define you. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. Hope you're enjoying the show. Please like and follow us on social media and help us spread the word by reposting our posts and telling others about the show. You can leave comments on the website at www.racyjujitsurocks.com. You can also go to iTunes and leave comments as well as rate the show. And we would appreciate a five-star rating, which helps us with our standing in iTunes. You can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. If you have suggestions for the show, please don't hesitate to give those. We always like feedback and suggestions. Okay, that's going to do it. So until next time, this is Marty Josie, and I'll see you on the mat.